The good old times had their share of tragedy. Winds and waves drove the Morrow Castle up to the beach at Asbury Park. She was still smoking from the fire that had made a charred hulk of the luxury liner. Panic was an extra oarsman in rescue efforts. The disaster was complicated by the fact that the skipper lay dead in his cabin before the blaze broke out. Death was an easy victor over the disorganized crew. On September 8, 1934, horrified onlookers watched as the smoldering hulk of a 500-foot-long cruise ship ran aground just off the New Jersey coast. By that point, the ship had been in flames for hours, and the bodies of men, women, and children were already washing ashore as firefighters struggled to contain the inferno. All told, 137 people would fall victim to the Moral Castle fire and many survivors suffered from burns, smoke inhalation, and lifelong trauma from enduring their day of terror. Today, nearly a century later, the Morrill Castle disaster is still shrouded in mystery and controversy. How could a modern $5 million ocean liner fall victim to something as mundane as a small fire? And, perhaps more puzzling, what caused the captain to suddenly fall ill and die in the hours leading up to the fire? Was it all just bad luck paired with negligence? Or was there something more sinister to it? In the days and weeks that followed the disaster, it was discovered that the Morrill Castle Inferno may have been the culmination of years of crooked behavior and discontent among the crew, and many people looked at one prominent crew member with a particularly shady past. In the late 1920s, the New York and Cuba Mail Steamship Company took advantage of funding from the Merchant Marine Act of 1928 to update its fleet. More commonly known as the Ward Line, the company had been hauling mail, freight, and passengers between the United States and Cuba for decades, but the $5 million 11,000-ton Morro Castle immediately became one of the line's flagship vessels when it launched from Newport News, Virginia in 1930. The Morrill Castle was elegant and comfortable, and she offered passengers the opportunity to drink legal alcohol during a time when prohibition was in effect in the United States. The promise of drinks, paired with lower rates because of the Great Depression, meant cruises aboard the Morrill Castle and her sister ship, the Oriente, were often well booked. On board, the ship was equipped with a series of fireproof steel doors, but designers had overlooked a critical detail, a six-inch gap that ran nearly the entire length of the ship between the decks and bulkheads. This gap, along with the highly flammable paint and lacquers that covered the walls and furniture, would go on to feed the deadly flames as they spread throughout the ship. Worse yet, inadequate water pressure meant that only six of the ship's 42 fire hydrants could be used at any one time. Yet despite these shortcomings, the Morrill Castle had a solid reputation for safely shuttling passengers between New York and Havana in style. Its reputation among the crew, however, was a different story. Crew members were often overworked and underpaid. Some of them resorted to smuggling drugs and refugees on board as a way to supplement their income. The Morrill Castle's captain, 55-year-old Robert Wilmot, had little patience with the crew and was under pressure from the ward line to stay on schedule. With a high turnover rate and unreliable crew, Wilmot would often leave Havana Harbor with his ship only partially staffed. Captain Wilmot also had a reputation for ignoring company policies so as not to inconvenience his passengers. This meant lifeboat drills were mostly skipped, and when one passenger tripped over a fire hydrant on board, he ordered several hoses to be disconnected and the hydrants covered. He also didn't want to run the risk of the smoke detector system going off needlessly as a result of fumes from cargo, so he turned off the whole system. Between a total disregard for safety regulations and the growing turmoil among the crew, the Moral Castle was ripe for disaster. On September 5, 1934, the Moro Castle steamed out of Havana Harbor on what would be her final voyage with 549 passengers and crew. The following day, as she sailed up the eastern seaboard, a strong storm began to develop, battering the ship with wind, rain, and waves, and forcing passengers to ride out the weather in their rooms. Nonetheless, the conditions weren't anything the captain and crew hadn't dealt with before, but that changed on the evening of September 7th when 55-year-old Captain Robert Wilmot was found dead in his cabin after complaining of stomach pains after dinner. The ship's physician put the death down to a heart attack brought on by acute indigestion, but some senior crew members found this hasty assessment odd. The doctor had drawn the same questionable conclusion on a previous voyage when another passenger had passed away under similar circumstances, 
With Captain Wilmot dead, the Morrow Castle was now in the hands of Chief Officer William Worms. Worms continued on toward New York City as the storm strengthened, but another misfortune befell the ship at approximately 2.45 a.m. on September 8th, when a concerned passenger alerted a steward that he smelled smoke coming from the ship's first-class writing room on B-deck. Upon investigating, the steward did indeed find a small fire in a storage area in the writing room, but the night watchman he reported it to thought it could be contained and chose not to sound the general alarm. Less than an hour later, the Morrow Castle was hopelessly engulfed in flames. Chief Officer Worms initially attempted to beach the ship, but he suddenly lost electrical power and the ship became unsteerable due to damage to the hydraulic system. He then decided they should attempt to launch the lifeboats. With the fire centered in the ship's midsection, passengers and crew assembled at the ship's bow and stern to escape the flames. When it became evident that the fire was out of anybody's control, many crew members opted to fend for themselves and leave the frantic passengers to their own devices. Out of the ship's 12 lifeboats, only six made it into the water, and on top of that, they only carried some 85 people out of a possible 400. Frantic passengers jumped into the stormy sea without life jackets, only to disappear beneath the waves. Mothers watched their children disappear in the water when they realized the life jackets were too big for kids. Despite the mayhem, Officer Worms remained on the bridge and radioed maydays to anyone with an earshot. The Andrea F. Lukenbach was the first rescue vessel to arrive on the scene. Two Coast Guard vessels followed, but their captains were reluctant to get too close to the flaming ship. Small private boats also began arriving as news of the Morro Castle spread up and down the coast but the dark and stormy conditions made it nearly impossible to see survivors. And in the end, the well-intentioned rescuers provided little in the way of actual assistance. Of all the vessels that came to the Morrow Castle's rescue that day, a small fishing boat called the Paramount and its crew deserved the most credit for pulling 67 survivors from the water and taking them to shore. Meanwhile, armies of volunteers on shore retrieved bodies from the surf and attended to the exhausted and terrified survivors. As darkness gave way to light, the still smoldering ship finally ran aground less than 100 yards off the beach at the resort town of Asbury Park. The Morrow Castle incident made front-page news around the world, and the gutted ship instantly became one of coastal New Jersey's most visited attractions. But now, investigators had the task of figuring out why 137 lives were so needlessly lost, and they quickly discovered that conditions for the crew on the Morrow Castle had been notoriously poor. The food was lousy, living conditions were cramped and uncomfortable, and the crew spent long stretches at sea away from their families. New and unskilled crew members often made as little as $30 a month, and many supplemented their meager incomes by pilfering cargo and smuggling cocaine and heroin into the United States. There were also rumors that the Morro Castle regularly hauled weapons from the United States to rebels in Cuba and that on return trips, undocumented asylum seekers paid crooked crew members to smuggle them on board. Unsurprisingly, these conditions led to high turnover and low morale that often boiled over into quarrels and physical altercations. As for the officers, Captain Wilmot's relationship with the crew was generally known to be tense, and some survivors stated that he'd become noticeably more withdrawn before his death. Captain Wilmot also commonly ignored routine safety measures and drills because he didn't want to inconvenience his passengers. There had also been an incident the month before the deadly blaze in which he downplayed the seriousness of a mysterious fire claiming it had been started by a carelessly tossed cigarette. By some accounts, Chief Officer William Worms had the same careless work ethic as Captain Wilmot. Worms was ultimately found guilty of negligence and misconduct for his actions before and during the deadly inferno. What do you think was the cause of the fire? Was it cigarettes? Perhaps, probably not. Was it lightning? No. Incendiarism? Probably. As far as you know, were all the passengers notified of the fire? Yes. Captain, how do you account for reports that of the lifeboats used, most of them contained members of the crew? The crew is assigned to the lifeboats to operate them. Were the lifeboats in workable condition? Absolutely. At least on the surface, the Morrow Castle disaster may have been caused by inherent design flaws, a disgruntled crew, and a small blaze that quickly got out of hand. But when the story of radio man George White Rogers is taken into account, things get far murkier and more sinister. Shortly after the disaster, Rogers was actually regarded as a hero because he was one of the few crewmen who stayed on the ship throughout the ordeal. However, 
Some of his fellow officers suspected that he'd actually started the fire. Investigators agreed, after learning that he'd been a suspect in an arson case at a previous employer before signing on with the Morrow Castle. This, however, wasn't enough evidence to charge him with the Morrow Castle fire, and Rogers was never investigated as a suspect. He went on to open his own radio repair shop in 1935, which also suspiciously went up in flames. In 1936, Rogers was hired as a radio assistant at the police department, but his supervisor, Lieutenant Vincent Doyle, became suspicious of his involvement in the Morrow Castle disaster and apparently questioned him about it multiple times. Tired of Doyle's suspicions, Rogers concocted a plan to get rid of him. One day, Doyle received a package from Rogers containing a fish tank heater and instructions to repair it. When Doyle plugged it in, the heater exploded, seriously injuring him. Rogers was convicted of Doyle's attempted murder in 1938 and received a 12 to 20 year sentence. Just four years later, he was released on parole to join the war effort. Though with his criminal past, it's no wonder the army politely declined his application. In 1945, Rogers opened yet another radio repair shop, but was struggling financially within a few years. A friend named William Hummel gave him $7,500 as a loan, but Hummel started demanding Rogers to repay the loan a year later. In 1953, Hummel and his daughter were found bludgeoned to death in their Florida home. Rogers was ultimately convicted of these two murders in 1954 and died in prison four years later. We'll probably never know if Rogers killed Captain Wilmot or started the Morrow Castle fire, but a number of theories have emerged in the absence of hard evidence. It's even been suggested that the ward line may have hired Rogers to torch the ship so they could collect the insurance money. Some suspect the federal government hired him to burn the ship to cover up its role in smuggling arms to Cuban rebels. Whatever the case, the Morrow Castle disaster led to stiffer maritime safety regulations that included the increased use of fire-resistant materials, improved bulkheads and fireproof doors, and mandatory emergency training for crew and passengers. <laughs>